Chapter 16 Forgiveness, an Unveiled Mystery In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Colossians 1 verse 14 Redemption in this context is related to the forgiveness of sins. Man was in bondage to the consequences of his own sins. The wrath of God was rekindled against him, and there was no genuine forgiveness for him. That was man's unseen bondage. Forgiveness of sins was never mentioned in the Bible until God established a system of atonement through the blood of animals. Two of the several definitions of forgiveness are to stop feeling anger towards someone and to stop requiring payment of something that is owed. Genuine forgiveness was something man never enjoyed from God, even in all his attempt to please him. Only the blood of Jesus could appease the anger of God for man and therefore turn the wrath of God away from man forever. In this dispensation of grace, God looks upon man with the eye of mercy and not judgment. Forgiveness is expensive in the spirit realm, but through Christ, we have received it at no cost. Adam was favored, but not forgiven. The eyes of Adam and Eve were opened to their nakedness after they ate the forbidden fruit. In order to redeem themselves, they resorted to sewing an apron out of fig leaves to cover their nakedness without knowing the spiritual implications. The apron of fig leaves sent again another disturbing message to God. Pride. The original Hebrew word for leaves in that context is Allah, meaning to ascend, exalt, or withdraw. The apron of leaves signified that they had exalted themselves higher than what they were made to be. So God asked Adam, Who told thee that thou wast naked? The leaves again signified that they were prepared to walk away from God's presence or withdraw from His guidance. When they stood before God, their ability to know they were naked and the apron of fig leaves they had sown for themselves proved their rebellion and pride toward Him. These happened to be the exact sins of the devil which forced God to throw him down from heaven to hell, when he said, I will ascend into heaven, set my throne above the stars of God, and be like the Most High. Isaiah 14, verse 12 to 15. The penalty for trying to be like God is always death. Remember, Eve ate the fruit of the tree of God and evil, because the serpent told her that her eyes would be opened and she would be like God. The penalty for man was an instant death in hell, but God still found a way to redeem man by humbling him so he could escape physical death. He drove man away from the Garden of Eden as he did the devil, but with man, God still wanted to have a relationship with him. So the Lord took away the apron of fig leaves, sewed for them coats of skins and clothed them. The original Hebrew word for skin in that context is uar, meaning to be exposed, laid bare or naked. Unconsciously, God took them back to their former state of humility by clothing them with a skin that signifies nakedness. In their eyes, they were covered, but in the eyes of God, they were naked people who needed His help because of the skin. When God replaced the fig leaves with a coat of skin, prophetically, pride and rebellion were being replaced by humility and submission respectively. Adam and Eve were driven out from Eden, clothed in humility and submission, so God's grace and mercy can still work for them. Likewise, you younger, submit yourself unto the elder, yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. 1 Peter 5 verse 5 The devil didn't achieve exactly what he wanted because God didn't throw man to hell to end the human race. God needs us to be humble so His grace can keep us away from the wages of our iniquities. Humility brought grace that spared them from being thrown to hell, as God did to Satan, but not forgiveness. They were not totally forgiven by God as He threw them out of Eden, cursed the woman, and cursed the ground for the sake of man. There was no forgiveness because the Bible didn't emphatically reveal that there was bloodshed in Eden. Blood is shed for the remission of sins. If there was bloodshed, God would have forgiven them and not cursed them and threw them out of Eden, who had delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. 
Colossians 1 verse 13 to 14. When God forgives, He calls people into His presence. He doesn't drive them away. All the people who have received forgiveness of sins have been called into the kingdom of His beloved Son. Adam and Eve were driven away because they were not forgiven. God only humbled them in His eyes and showed them mercy and kindness to live. I have heard many people say, God shed blood in the Garden of Eden to make the coat of skin. I beg to differ. He calls the things that are not as though they were. If Moses had not revealed that God created the woman out of the rib of the man, many theologians would have concluded that God created Eve from the dust of the earth because that would have been the only way to create another human being. If blood was shed, they would have been forgiven and not driven away from the garden. God must have spoken the skin into being. Who knows? It was only after Jesus Christ shed his blood that man experienced God's total forgiveness. The curses on Adam and his exit from the Garden of Eden was the result of God's unforgiveness. The blood of bulls and goats could not wash away sins. It could not appease God enough to let go of the iniquities of mankind. Moses and Aaron had to face the consequences of their sins, even after they atoned for them with the blood of animals. The forgiveness of God was unpredictable. Moses and Aaron pleaded with tears, yet they could not go to the promised land. Though God was merciful, yet He was not bound by any worthy sacrifice to forgive by all means. So He forgave men as He willed, but not under any obligation. After David had fasted seven days to seek God's forgiveness for sleeping with Bathsheba, he still had to face the consequences. Elia, forgiveness was defined as to stop requiring something that is owed. So though David's life was spared, he had to pay for what he did. After this, Ammon, the son of David, raped his own sister, Tamar. Absalom killed Ammon, his own brother. Absalom slept with all the wives of David openly before Israel. Then the worst of all, Absalom chased David out of his palace. All these things happened after he, David, committed that sin. Was God merciful? Yes. He didn't kill David. But did he forgive him? No. David had to pay for what he did. The story changed, however, when Jesus Christ ascended the cross. He shed his sinless blood that had power not just to cover sins, but also to wash them away. Only the blood of Jesus Christ could let God forget the sins of man. Jesus Christ did not just sacrifice His blood for the remission of our sins. He also bore the consequences and curses of our sins. Galatians 3 verse 13 Thus through Christ, God was bound to approach the sins of men in a totally different way. For I will be merciful to the unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Hebrews 8 verse 12 This is very true. The blood of Jesus has negotiated this deal for us. If one believes and confesses his or her sins, God forgives and never remembers that sin again. The person who automatically escapes the consequences of his or her past sins, hallelujah! The children of Israel had to face the consequences of their sins because God remembered them. God could not forget sins. But it is very easy for him now just at the sight of the blood of Jesus Christ. There are many sinners that God is still preserving their lives, though they don't believe in the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. These are people whose sins have not yet been blotted by the blood of Jesus because of their unbelief. They don't have forgiveness from God. They are still in darkness and deserve death and hell as punishment. Yet God is still keeping them from death for the hope of their salvation. That is the grace of God that was revealed in the Garden of Eden. He spared the life of Adam and Eve by grace, having in his mind the coming of Jesus Christ later to sacrifice his blood for their forgiveness. This grace of God never worked for Satan because God chose not to humble him in his eyes. Attorney of Forgiveness The book of Revelation reveals Jesus as the one who has the keys of hell and death. He had the keys of heaven, hell and death, but promised to give unto us the keys of heaven and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Matthew 16 verse 19 It was a promise he gave to the disciples. I will give you the keys of heaven.
So after his resurrection, he honored the promise and released the key unto them. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive you the Holy Ghost. John 20 verse 22. The Holy Spirit is the key who unlocks the heavens for us to have access to the hidden treasures of our Father, according to our heart desires. There are many privileges of having this key, but Jesus Christ revealed to us one of the most important privileges of this key. Most important privileges of this key, when we receive the key. Whatsoever things we bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever things we lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In Matthew 18 verse 18, he repeated this same statement when he spoke on forgiveness. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and publican. Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Matthew 18 verse 15 to 18. Jesus spoke on forgiveness as a very important attribute we have to exhibit when we receive the Holy Spirit. The key was going to give us the power to release our offenders through forgiveness. We use the binding and losing in this context as warfare prayer, but actually, Jesus was teaching us on the effect of forgiveness and on forgiveness in the heavenly places after we received the key. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. John 20 verse 22 to 23. This is what he initially meant by saying, I will give you the keys of heaven. And whatsoever you bind shall be bound, and whatsoever you lose shall be loosed in heaven. After Jesus' resurrection, he broke down the mystery. He breathed and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now if you forgive, it is forgiven in heaven. But if you withhold the sins of anyone, it is withheld in heaven. This is the reason why every Christian anointed with the Holy Spirit ought to learn to forgive his or her offenders. We have the key to lock up and unlock heaven to our offenders. If you decide not to forgive, heaven will also not forgive. With this insight, we must know that it is quite dangerous to hold grudges in our hearts. Jesus and Stephen had to seek forgiveness for their torturers just before they died. That speaks volumes. Don't die holding on to offenses. Let us learn to forgive our offenders as Holy Spirit-filled people daily. Three times in the New Testament epistles, we are told of our priesthood as we have become saints and hath made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. Revelations 1 verse 6. We are priests unto God and one of the roles of the priests in the Old Testament order of worship was to make sacrifices to pardon the sins of the people before God. When they accused Jesus of casting out demons with Beelzebub, he told them, If you sin against the Son, it shall be forgiven. But if you sin against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31 to 32. He only wanted them to know that they are not just offending Him, but the Spirit controlling Him. We are priests because of the Spirit that dwells in us. For that matter, anyone who speaks against us or offends us also offends the Spirit that controls us. So how do they receive forgiveness since anyone who offends the Spirit should not be forgiven? Matthew 12, 31-32 Except the priest in whom he dwells consistently forgive the offenders, and so their forgiveness becomes a pardon unto him also. The first among the Trinity to be offended is the Holy Spirit because he dwells in men and the person of the Father and Son. As priest, we have to be forgiving and also seek forgiveness before God for our offenders because of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. When we wholeheartedly forgive, the Holy Spirit also forgives and lets go of any offense. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. John 20 verse 22 to 23.
The only way the awesome Spirit of God in us forgives is by us forgiving others. We become murderous if we refuse to forgive because we prohibit people from receiving forgiveness for their offenses. Remember, though, that Jesus said, If you refuse to forgive, you should be considered as a publican, sinner, someone without the Holy Spirit. People with the Spirit are always moved by the Spirit to forgive. No one needs forgiveness from a sinner because the Spirit of God does not dwell in him or her. He is not qualified to seek for forgiveness for anyone before God because he has not yet been made a priest of God. When you offend a sinner, you ought to seek forgiveness from God, but be polite to seek forgiveness from him or her also. Again, when you offend a believer in whom the Holy Spirit dwells, you need to seek forgiveness from God and the believer also. Make sure he or she has forgiven you, even if you have to involve the whole church to apologize on your behalf. In Matthew 18, Jesus talked about believers because he told them if the offenders refused their plea, they should go with the church to apologize also. This mystery is meant for believers who have the Spirit of God in them, not unbelievers. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglects to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Often, we take our Christian brothers and sisters for granted. We are never bothered to seek forgiveness when we grieve them because they are not like the worldly folks who can drag us to court or prison. But I tell you today that the spiritual consequences of offending someone filled with the Holy Spirit is more detrimental than offending someone being controlled by the devil. He therefore that despiseth not man but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 8 The Spirit of God who lives in us makes us more of spirit men than natural men. This is an important revelation our Lord Jesus gave about the eternity of forgiveness we received when the Holy Spirit came in us. Every Spirit-filled believer who refuses to forgive, even when his or her offenders, have sought for forgiveness will be considered as a sinner before God, and he will not be forgiven by God also. Every believer has become God's temple, house of God, in which he dwells. When Jacob had a dream in Bethel and saw the Lord on top of a ladder that touched the heavens, he called the place the house of God. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Genesis 28 verse 17 Jacob unveiled another mystery here. What it means to be called the house of God. The house of God is the gate of heaven. He knew it was through the house of God one gets access to heaven. If we are the house of God, then we have to also see ourselves again as the gate of heaven. We can give access or deny access through forgiveness or unforgiveness respectively. Though there are gates in heaven, symbolically we as the house of God have also become one of the gates to the heavenly realms. Bitterness, unforgiveness, and grudge-bearing have denied many access to heaven. We have to be quick to forgive, thinking of the dangers of unforgiveness. There was a time our Lord Jesus told us to suspend our sacrifice and make peace with our offenders before we come back to give our offerings. Brother James is an ex-convict who got born again miraculously in prison after seven, eight of his 15-year jail sentence. He eventually decided to give his life to Christ. He was ready to give up on everything, but not this one thing, to forgive his trusted friend who betrayed him, which landed him into police custody. He had planned before his conversion to harm that so-called friend messlessly should he return from the prison alive. After a few months of knowing the Lord, God visited him and his jail sentence was nullified. He was released from jail and he started studying the Bible, filled with the Holy Ghost and fellowshipping with us in our church. On Monday, 21st of July, 2014, he had a visitor and surprisingly, it was his old betrayer. The gentleman began apologizing wholeheartedly for what he did to him and pleaded that he takes him back as a brother. Brother James forgave him from his heart, took him back, prayed for him and preached Christ to him that same day. The next day, Tuesday afternoon, Brother James heard that his old-time betrayer who had just become a lover in Christ had died in a fatal accident. He had run his car into a tipper truck. What was pushing that betrayer to seek forgiveness a day before his death?
Certainly it was God. God wanted to save the soul of that gentleman, but he needed to be forgiven by the Holy Spirit-filled friend he betrayed. Beloved, it is too risky to be offending people who are carriers of the Holy Spirit. As the gates of heaven, we are expected by God to lead many into his marvelous kingdom, but not to deny them access. When you deny someone from entering, you will also be denied. Unforgiveness should by no means be justified in our walk with God, considering the danger it poses. Therefore, in the natural sense, forgiveness is the best treatment anyone can give to himself. Unforgiveness is said to be sentenced to the cell of bitterness to serve the jail time of a crime someone else has committed. It is like taking in poison and yet expecting another person to die. Jesus was quick to reveal this mystery of forgiveness when he said the gate of hell shall not prevail against the church. And I tell you, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Matthew 16 verse 18 to 19 As the strength of the gate of heaven, house of God, lies in forgiveness, so the strength of the gate of hell also lies in unforgiveness. We conquer through forgiveness and we are defeated also through unforgiveness. The weapon of the devil, which is unforgiveness, targeted at the church, shall not prosper if only we can live a forgiven life through the grace bestowed on us by the Holy Spirit. The gates of heaven, which also represents righteousness, opens, loose, through forgiveness and closes, binds and unforgiveness whereas the gate of hell, representing death and sin, opens through unforgiveness and closes at forgiveness. We received forgiveness from the Father through the death of Christ Jesus for our great sins, and He expects us to forgive people of the little sins they commit against us.